So we will begin. Clearly one of the most important things about this event is the speakers and the presentations, but the other really important piece is all of you, the participants in the audience, whoever you're sitting next to, um, make sure you talk to them. They're here just like you are because of what they've done and what they will do. And we hope that the interaction and network thing, networking that you're able to do uh, makes this worth the, the trip for you. Um, I'm Carla Shepard Rubinger. I'm the executive director of the Rosalind Franklin Society. First, I want to urge you to look at the materials, not necessarily right now, but certainly take it with you, the information in the board book that you received when you come, came in. That does have the agenda as of November 1st. Uh, there are some changes in that, and we will announce those as we go through it. But there also is other important information there. I particularly want to um, make sure you look at the appendix. It, in this case, is not a vestigial organ. It's a very important set of information. Some of it, some of it reflects the information that presenters will be talking about. Some of it is some background information on RFS, and some of it is um, just some um, press releases and announcements of important work that we want to bring to your attention, such as the research that Equileap has just research has just released on gender representation in largest corporations around the world. Um, it's fabulous information. Their website is is in there. Um, my other important job. Um, is a great one and a short one because bios are in your book, but I really want to quickly introduce Marianne Liebert, who is the founder of RFS and the founder of Marianne Liebert Incorporated. Um, for the few of you who don't know, we publish 90 peer-reviewed journals. Marianne started the company 40 years ago, many years ago, and still going. Um, and the question we often still get is, is there really a Marianne Liebert? And there is, and you will have the pleasure of hearing from her today. Um, and our president, Rita Caldwell, who most of you know, and those of you who don't know her certainly know of her. Um, Rita is an amazing leader and a tireless leader. I am following in her footsteps as fast as I can, but impossible. She is the author of 16 books, 800 articles, 60 three honorary degrees. I have to check on it every year because there are always more. Um, she's an international presence. Her work both in the academic world and the corporate world is huge and important. And if we ever needed a role model, there is one. Um, but I now want to just introduce Mary Ann to start us off and get us on track. And I will try and keep us on track. It's a little hard. all of you this morning and the first words I have to say to you is we are making a difference when we started out seven years ago we realized that we needed to ensure the legacy of Rosalind Franklin now today believe it or not many people have never heard of her even though in next year it will be celebrating her hundredth year but that's not so surprising perhaps when you think about the fact that when you mention Francis Crick, a lot of people don't know, young people aren't sure exactly who he is unless you mention Watson and Crick. So it's a time for women, and it's a time for women to move forward, and as forward as we've come, we have so far to go. Our first president was Joe Handelson, and we had gotten a call from the White House at the time when they were searching for a director of the Office in Science and Technology Policy. We have made a difference in making sure that more women are nominated for prizes, and um, we are making sure that women get more tenure-track positions. And so what I thought I would do this morning is welcome Rita Caldwell, our president, and we're going to have a little discussion and I'm going to ask her, she has had such an astounding career, and so I thought I would ask her some questions, the kind of questions you might want to ask her yourself, and she can tell us, because she's had the most extraordinary experiences. So, Rita. Okay. 
Okay, first of all, I think it's important to mention to you that Rita was the first woman president of the National Science Foundation. Is that correct? Well, they, they refer to it as director, but um, director. Pres president sounds even better. Director, <laughs> president. I think that's worth a big hand. <laughs> okay. Rita travels all over the world all the time. She is a renowned marine biologist. Her passion has been and still is always science, and she's still doing all of it. She's also, um, in, in, in addition to her academic achievements, she started a very successful biotechnology company. Rita. Well, thank you, Larry, and uh, welcome to all of you. It's, it's really a pleasure to, to uh, gather again and, and uh, join you in recognizing the Rosalind Franklin Society recognizing Marianne Liebert and Phil Kala for the work that they have done over the last decade or more. I won't go into details on that. Uh, and it's terrific that um, the Rosalind Franklin Society is focused on recognizing women. There are lots of scientific societies for presenting um, data and uh, findings, which we will do, and that's a good part of our, our program, but it, it's it seems that there's a, a, a lack of ability to recognize and for women scientists, technicians, engineers, humanists for that matter, to be, to, to, to be able to be recognized in a way that's appropriate to their work and endeavors. So the Rosalind Franklin Society um, makes sure that it promotes women um, and we address, I think, the issue of Try to get women to help each other, because that's another very important part, I think, of, of uh, women being recognized for the work that they do. Um, I also would like to um, say that it's important for us to meet, as we do, to uh, focus on outstanding women leaders. Uh, but I think it's also important that we should promulgate what we're doing. In other words, make it more widely known. Um, so that's sort of my introductory welcome to all of you. Well, Rita, you know, one of the things when we started the Rosalind Franklin group was that we wanted to include men as well as women because men have been and are increasingly more active in trying to recruit more women for positions and to help them come up the ladder. Now, what do you think today that situation is? And women are not necessarily <coughs> as good as men in helping other women achieve prominence. Well, there's two points. First of all, uh, clearly uh, male mentors meant a huge amount for me. Uh, first, my father, um, there are six of us children and uh, three, girls and three boys, and my dad insisted that we all went to university, even though uh, the culture at the time might have uh, let the boys go to college and the girls not, but that wasn't dad's approach. Secondly, I was very fortunate in the undergraduate advisor at Purdue University, where I chose to go because the scholarship I got to Radcliffe didn't pay all the tuition. Purdue did, so I've never regretted. Um, and there, and my undergraduate advisor was critical, and then my PhD advisor at the University of Washington was absolutely key. So there are great guys out there, but the most important guy was my husband, Jack. Now, Jack was there whenever I needed him. So you see, you need mentors, you need friends, and you need men and women. Now, your point about women not necessarily helping each other, I think, my going through at a time in the 50s when um, it was very, very conservative period, um, that many women who were very, very bright um, didn't have the opportunities or didn't make the opportunities and therefore <coughs> probably a deep resentment. And I think that was negative in helping women get ahead. So I, I think it's important to have a, a Rosalind Franklin Society where women get together 
with some wonderful men who are in the audience, bless you, um, because you're supporters. Uh, and that gives us an opportunity, I think, to take our rightful place in the hierarchy of science, government, uh, education. So that's my point. Well, I think, you know, I just finished reading uh, Women at Yale, and then at Carla's suggestion, I read Kept, Keep the Damn Women Out, which had to do with co-education uh, at Princeton. And it is amazing to me, really, when I think about it, and I'm from Chicago, that all this was going on on the East Coast. And so I didn't even consider going to an Ivy because there was, they weren't, women weren't really welcome. In science today, women are welcome, and there are men that are advocating for women. Are they advocating more for women than women are advocating for themselves? I think so. I think women are still, first of all, they feel there's less room at the top. Even though there's, there have been, there are now leaders at the heads of major universities. But when it comes to helping women up the ladder, they don't always mentor as well as men. And I don't know why, but that's why it's so important that the Rosalind Franklin Foundation Society has men as well as women. So why is it? Is, it there, le is there less room at the top in terms of science? Are women, and we know, by the way, that women are less likely to nominate other women for prizes and awards. Now, why, why is this, do you think? Well, this is an innate bias. The uh, National Academy of Science uh, Committee on Women in Science, Engineering, and Medicine uh, will be reporting tomorrow uh, on the um, report that was released uh, just this last year on sexual harassment. I think um, one of the, the, the big difficulties is that there's an innate bias, and this was demonstrated by the publication that Joe Handelsman and her colleagues um, developed, where they sent out an identical CV. One was listed John, Jane, and the other Jane. And uh, the folks were asked to rate uh, the individuals and to suggest a salary. Uh, men and women um, ranked the male higher than the woman, identical CV, and suggested a higher salary for the male than for the woman. This, this, this is very um, peculiar, and I think it needs to be um, overcome. It's a, it's a handicap, and it's a handicap in thinking, but it's an innate bias um, that can't be legislated. I think it has to be socialized. And I think gatherings like the Rosalind Franklin Society is one of the many ways and an important way to, I think, um, overcome this innate bias that girls can't do science. Or girl, I, the one I hate most of all is that girls can't do math. That drives me wacky uh, because girls definitely can do math. It's just that it turns out that the way math is taught and when it's taught is geared to young adolescent boys and not to young adolescent girls. Girls do much better earlier on, and if they were taught algebra earlier than boys, I think they would do a whole lot better. Anyway, these are the kinds of societal, psychological issues that have to be addressed. I think that we need to say, when will there be a bigger difference? We're making progress, but we need to make more progress. Well, my, I, I serve on the Board of Trustees at the University of Tokyo and also the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. And Japan has a serious problem in that the society is aging, the birth rate has dropped, women are uh, uh, not given an equal opportunity, and, that, and the president and even the prime minister of Japan is working really hard because they understand that 50% of the talent, 51% actually, to be factually uh, accurate, um, are women of any society and, and the talent. Uh, as I told the president of the University of Tokyo, uh, the intelligence genes 
do not reside on the Y chromosome. In fact, there aren't very many genes in the Y chromosome except for reproducing sperm. So anyway, um, I think it's really critical for any society, for national um, security, for the economy, for social stability, that there be this equality of opportunity for the really bright people and for all <coughs> men and women to, to be able to achieve to the best of their ability and to contribute to society to the best of their ability. When do you think we are going to see a change that will satisfy you? <clears throat> well, one of the studies that I've done, which is kind of interesting, is that um, at MIT, Nancy Hopkins, one of my heroes, um, decided, as you all I'm sure are aware of, that um, she, the women at MIT were not being given the resources they needed. She did a study, actually went out and measured the laboratories of the women and the men, and uh, it turned out that uh, the size of the laboratories for women were much smaller. In any case, this was brought to the attention of the president, and to his credit, um, um, he reacted positively, as did the provost, Bob Bergeron. And so there was a bump in the hiring of women faculty um, from, I think, 9 or 10% to something like 15 or 17, maybe 19%. But years later, we did a study, and that number hasn't changed very much. In other words, <clears throat> the number of women faculty at MIT has not doubled in the last 30 years or 20 years since Nancy Hopkins' study. So we have a long way to go. Well, thank you very much, Rita. And I encourage all of you, when we have our breaks, to speak to Rita personally. She has traveled all over the world many times. She has published all of these papers. A biography is coming out. And we are so lucky to have her as president of, Ro of Rosalind Franklin um, Society. So I hope that you will take the time during breaks to ask her any questions that we are not asking her right now, and she'll tell you what she thinks. Thank you so much. <laughs>